Okay, uh, folks, thank you for squeezing in like a, a, a family, ought to. And um, I just have a few flyers from our African American African Studies Brown Bag series that are left. This is our last in our series, but if you want to take one as your memento of this occasion, you're more than welcome. Um, I'm uh, Professor Alifu Osamari here in African American African Studies, and um, our director back there, Milman Harrison, is here, and it was really his um, idea to have uh, uh, Margaret Kemp, a visiting professor in theater and dance, come and be a part of our series. Um, the presentation today is called My Mother Talks in English but Dreams in Spanish. Her secrets are in her dreams. Listen. Uh, it will be a performance talk. She is beginning the performance right now, and it's downstairs on the first floor. However, you do not have to go down, but she wants you to know that. So whoever comes through there, she will, her performance starts there. Then she will come upstairs, come into the room, and continue the performance here. However, she did want me to let you know that it's starting down there, and any uh, of those folks who are here as the audience who would like to see the very beginning of the work, you may go downstairs now. La fortaleza in Calzara existe un río debajo de río nada la fortaleza la my knees are ashy. I live in the future. I bury my treasures. Hear it? It's growing! An orange mango tree! I planted the seeds myself! <laughs> My ears are supersonic! Ooh. A pumpkin seed and three raisins. It's an experiment! Dirt. Everybody likes dirt! And grass. Soft and wet. Uh, wet, 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 <laughs> wet, wet. The adult human body is about seventy percent water, and water has perfect memory. It's forever trying to reclaim the valley it runs through, the banks there were, its original place. Beneath the river, time stretches like breath. Dirt at the bottom of the river is pre-river, like breath is pre-sound. Pre-river nourishes breath, the carrier of human language. A sense of identity names, a sense of self frames, creates worlds in telling, uh, fact-telling, lie-telling, myth-telling, storytelling. Los Angeles is a watery town, <laughs> in name only. <laughs> Streets with names like Spring, Glendale, Atwater, remind, once there was water. El Rio de Los Angeles is a lady, cross-dressing and temperamental with secrets hiding among glistening oil, wet clay, a flood of wild sunflowers, giant rose bushes, and in plain sight, a flock of cinnamon teals, curving alders, and white-tipped cottonwoods in the hips of her rich, fragrant, dangerous, musical, moist bends. 
Floyd Angelino. I like the sound of that. Whenever words put me in a frame of mind or being that I don't like, I just melt them down into new frames. To name is to possess. It's my freedom from. It's my freedom to. My father's first trip to the United States from the islands was in 1944. Every time I see my Aunt May, she says to me, he might as well have told me he was going to the moon, Atlanta. He left Nassau, Bahamas, a young man, and arrived in Miami five hours later, a boy. Confident the change in status was only temporary, he made his way to Atlanta, where he arrived five days later, a boy still. Confident flavor disappointment made him itchy-footed and curious. He would tell me, so I decided to take a trip across the country by train. No details, just two and two and two, and I love this plummy story of adventure and always wanted the juice. As regular as a Hamilton watch, I'd pull on the sleeve of my daddy's cuffling shirt. Were you off to seek your fortune, daddy? Were you off to seek your fortune, daddy? Why did you leave? Were you off to seek your fortune, daddy? Why did you stay? Never any juice, just the skin. I only possess the idea of my father, really. What were the circumstances of his birth? When? Does he prefer the United States to the Bahamas? Why? Swim and swim and swim in my head, but his answers only let me see the backs of his as he smiles for the last time, waving his last goodbye. From state to state. Took me three months to get to Chicago, where they called him Darkie. Three more months to Utah, where they called him George. Three more months to Nevada, colored. I took a hook around. It took me six months to get to Boston, Negro. I thought I had my best chance there. Today, it'll take him 14 hours to get from Nassau, Bahamas to Los Angeles, California, and he'll arrive an African-Caribbean man. Once, there was a neighborhood where on cool evenings, a realtor who happened to be making a killing, igniting white flight might hear an amazing grace. Here I come, here I come, Kelly cake, Kelly cake, Kelly cake. Ah! This is how you bring a secret family recipe, 3,000 miles. You wrap it up tight and you deliver it fresh. Ah, she, Mary Linda, you know you are a marvel. Ah, you know you're not talking to me. You talking to that cake. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> oh, Mr. Kemp, would you please bless the table? Bless this food to our nourishment and our lives to thy service and keep us ever mindful of the needs of others. Amen. <laughs> oh, please pass the conch fritters. Uh, we are quiet Negroes. Uh, uh, please pass the sauce. Uh, not angry enough to be black. Uh, please pass the peas and rice and uh, not empowered enough to earn the hyphen required to be African American. Uh, uh, please pass the, um, oh, the cassava. Oh. You mean yuca. I mean cassava. I'm not from Cuba. Ah, yeah. uh, please pass the shrimp. Uh, please pass the hot sauce. Mm. Oh, she. And uh, Mr. Finlayson, this grouper here is sublime, man. Please tell me, where did you find grouper here? I didn't. My sister. She brought it on the plane, on her lap. <laughs> we are watery people. Moist with our islands, we come with shells in our pockets and hope on our breath. And you mustn't forget us. You mustn't forget us <laughs> on our mind. Bound to our families and our neighborhoods by an indigenous dream, freedom to freedom to make this little neighborhood home. Once there was a neighborhood where on warm evenings, a realtor who happened to be making a killing practicing restrictive covenants might hear hearts a flutter. 
stars shining up above you. Night breezes seem to whisper, I love you. Birds singing in the sycamore trees, dream a little dream of me. The gathering glides into our French provincial plastic coated living, no, dancing room where we whine, 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 down, 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 shake a bungie, shake a bungie, shake a bungie, I, no, 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 no old country, rake and scrape, jug and jump, sweaty island dancing. Daddy prefers a new world Louis Armstrong growl and blare that sometimes shares with Ella. Say nighty night and kiss me. The genetic dances mutate into an Arthur Murray studied smooth American foxtrot, cha cha cha, two step. While I'm all alone, as blue as can be, dream a little dream of me. Howard and Olivia, good night. You really do have it all. Home. Thank you. My mom talks in English, but dreams in Spanish. Her secrets are in her spirit dreaming. Listen. Ya ha pasado el tiempo en que nos cortamos nuestras lenguas. Ya ha pasado el tiempo en que nos cortamos nuestras lenguas. Once there was a neighborhood where on Indian summer nights you might hear singing sometimes. Niña estará bien. Ella a la universidad y todo estará bien. Hey, what are you doing? Sleeping on the couch. To bed, to bed. School tomorrow. You can't go to university if you can't wake up for fifth grade. Hey, pajamas. Prayers. <laughs> Story, yes. Let me think. I, yes. In past time, past the time there is now, it rained and rained until it rained for 300 million years. And in the midst of that rain grew an island of roots, roots and roots. And from that island of roots, trees, trees as thick as families. And on this island of roots and trees grew a maiden. And her every day was the same, searching for the island river that she could hear but could not see. And she would search and search until she became so tired that she laid down to rest. But she didn't know that she rested on the bed of 300 million years of rain. And her pillow was made of twisted and confused roots. And so she rested. 
And one night, she heard bump, bump, heartbeat, rise from beneath the ground. Oh, she closed her ears and covered her body and moved her head, but still, bump, bump, heartbeat. Finally, she opened her eyes. What a sight she saw. Splish, splash, the water lapped like feet were pressing their souls from beneath to break out of the river. She had the urge to rescue. She reached out to hold the invisible body. And just then, the true roots, tree roots became fingers, and they reached up and grabbed her into the river. Oh, she fought the water. She fought the bump, bump, heartbeat. She reached back for a tree, and it vanished into the earth. She reached into the earth and discovered the roots. She reached for the roots, and they melted into her flesh. Down, down, she reached until she discovered a bed of dry bones. She held onto the bones, and they melted into seeds. Desperate to avoid full immersion, she called into far away for her mother, and only the river answered, Rechinaba! Cruhia Bailo con huesos de barro Bailo con espíritu sin nombre Bump, bump, heartbeat is her song. Existe un rio. There is a river. Debajo del rio. <coughs> Under the river. Nada for fortaleza. Swim for strength. And every time it rains for months or doesn't rain for weeks and weeks, I long for my mother. Science has proven my mother right. There is a river under the river. You see, there's a river. And there's a river. And there's a river. Thank you very much. Interdisciplinary artist, Professor Margaret Kemp. Um, you just saw her uh, piece that she basically put together for this presentation. My mother talks in English, but dreams in Spanish. Her secrets are in her dreams. Listen. Reimagining Latina, Latino, and Caribbean diasporas in performance. It's, the scenes are taken from a larger work that she has been touring with called Confluence, previously entitled, A Negro Speaks of Rivers. Um, I'd just like to mention a little bit about her credits because you should know the artist whom you just witnessed. And I, I would venture to say that um, she is doing some imaginative, beautiful new work that we need to see more of. Don't you think so? Um, she is a visiting assistant professor here at UC Davis in the Department of Theater and Dance and is a multidisciplinary artist and theater educator specializing in the area of performance, acting, voice, and speech. Her past artistic credits are very numerous. I'll just mention a few. 
They include a commission by the city of Los Angeles to write and direct From the Rock for their Los Angeles Plays The River project, which brought together professional and community artists to explore the nature of language and movement as a river that connects generations and communities. She's appeared on regional and international stages, including the Arena Stage, the Mark Taper Forum, Yale Rep, Theater of Changes in Athens, Greek, uh, Greece, uh, Red Pear Theater in uh, Thebes, France, and the Magnet Theater in Cape Town, South Africa. She has just returned from an Australian tour of her solo performance of Confluence, previously entitled A Negro Speaks of Rivers. And she has recently presented her newest work called Imaginary Landscapes, A Memory in Progress, which explores the role of memory in performance. And uh, on November of next year, she will perform chapter one of Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God at the St. John the Divine Cathedral in Harlem. Uh, Margaret will talk to you about the work that you just saw and then entertain any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. respond to all the questions because my notes are, they can either be a lot of notes or little notes, depending on the needs of the situation. Good. Anybody have any questions? Where do you um, do your writing and practicing for this? Where do I rehearse? Yeah. My car, <laughs> in the line, <coughs> in my head. <laughs> no, um, and, I, and when I'm, um, well, how, how did I rehearse this particular chunk that you saw? Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't happen. Uh -huh. um, I know I didn't have. It, I was, <clears throat> did not have an opportunity to re, to rehearse this chunk that I performed. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's always like a, a thing between your practice and your teaching. And I actually do train my students to know that. You, your instrument does have to be ready. That's part of why you have a daily practice, so that you are not freaked out by the fact that you teach until noon and this starts at noon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have two questions. Um, first is the river kept mentioning the river. Can you explain the symbolic importance of that? And then the second one is your background. Like, um, why is it important to, I guess, um, talk about the importance of Afro-Caribbean ancestry. Okay, that's so good. Two great questions. So did everyone hear the question? Great. So I'll start with why I think it's vitally important for people to tell their stories. So it's not just, I mean, this is important to me because that is, those are my roots. Um, but actually my, my newest piece, I actually am telling Native American stories and stories that are not particularly mine, because I do feel that our, as we, you asked about the river and the significance of it, and it's not just the river, but it's the whole environment, because I feel that in the United States um, specifically, that so much of our history is held in the environment that we live in. There are stories that are in the groundwater, there are stories in the earth, and when we own those, good, bad, um, or, or troublesome, we are making, we are owning ourselves. And in doing that, I feel that we can <coughs> melt borders that are between us and often cause difficulties. And specifically in the longer work, in regard to the river, um, the Los Angeles River, um, is paved, most of it's paved over, 54 miles of 
concrete. And the metaphor is how, not only how you treat this small natural resource, not even that small, but treat this natural resource in reference to how we treat the body. So for example, or how we treat in individuals. So in my new work, I, one of the things I'm sort of playing with is um, the sound of screaming and the idea that people are, mass media is sort of making people um, concretizing the, the structure so that you don't have a response to this thing that's coming through your community. So the metaphor for the river is a metaphor for the body and how we treat that river is how we treat our communities and how we treat ourselves and questioning whether or not that's healthy. In the life of the play, one thing we learn about the play is in one of the most underserved communities of Los Angeles, every, um, throughout the winter, the concrete shifts and the river busts through the concrete every year. So they have to go back and repave it over to maintain this sort of myth. Um, and if in, I mean, everybody here at, at East University is really, really kind of educated, and you can, I think, you can see the metaphor. It's kind of re-establishing this myth all the time and how the river creates a really great narrative for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Well, thank you for this exciting glimpse at, at your work. Uh, <coughs> my first time seeing your work, so I can't wait to see more. I'll have to go to New York, I guess, next. Um, I am interested in two things. First, the process. You. In what we saw, you, you're considering migration and the transition of the language of identity, and then also considering these diasporic connections, vis-a-vis -vis culinary uh, moments at the table and so forth. When you're writing and thinking about these big ideas, which are in, throughout various literature, right, but you're bringing it to a personal level, which comes first? Are you thinking, I want to explore this first, and then saying, do I do this through my grandfather, my uncle, my mother, me? Uh, or is it reverse, you know, which is first? And then the other question I have is more just a kind of technical acting process question. You appear to be so in the moment. You are very much in the moment. And if you could maybe just give us a little hint without telling your secrets, of course, I know you hold on to our secrets, as to how you exercise yourself <laughs> into that moment, you know, because it's, it's so there, it's, it's so present. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I actually... I'm, I write really fast. I write like a first draft so fast it is a little scary. Um, and then I start, I, then I look at the ideas that are in it. And I start saying, well, that's interesting. Maybe I should read something about the geography of, uh, of the antebellum south and find out a little bit more and how will that, will that inform me. And then I'll sort of play with this, the sounds of the language and the story, feeling how it feels in my body, and then um, put it on paper. And it's sort of an ongoing negotiation between research and practice. But the first part is done pretty quickly. Like, if somebody <coughs> told yeah, I could tell you the story of my new work, you know, in a moment, and then the, you know, the two years down the road is is all the, the research that helps, I hope, to, um, no, I like it to be entertaining, but it is, it's really important for me, to, for the work, to have um, a resonance that goes beyond entertainment. And, um, and in terms of training, I mean, I am teaching in the department, so I'm giving the secrets away if anybody wants them. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I think there are a couple of things that are really specific to the work. Danica there is one of my MFA students, and um, we have this thing that we do before we start the work of the class. We do this thing, this physical practice. So it's um, about 45 minutes of voice work and about 45 minutes of physical work. And the voice work um, is very specifically rooted in Fitzmore's voice work. I'm, I'm a certified instructor. I've been teaching it for seven years. It's a wonderful way of investigating the body, the breath, and sound as a gateway to um, <coughs> training and performance. And um, physical work, which um, is a combination of body weather work, which is a kind of an offshoot of Bhutto, and Michael Chekhov work, which is based um, in the psychophysical approach to act acting. 
So thinking about large gestures or small gestures and having a sensation that you do them so often that they become some kind of narrative that is coming out of an ex inner experience that then becomes one <coughs> that we can see in the outer world. Yeah, so that's what we do. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? <coughs> Excellent. What time do we have? Uh, it's uh, about uh, 1241. Okay. We're doing what we're doing. Great. <coughs> I thought it might be interesting. Um, I wrote an article that was published um, by American Theatre Online. And part of in part of the article, I talk about um, taking this performance to um, South Africa, and I think it speaks to your question about research and practice, because um, this story has made its way into an, another performance of mine that um, might be doing it in New York, but who knows. Um, Pages all fell on the floor when I came in here. It's not my fault. <coughs> okay. I have to wing it. So, and the article is based on the reading of. Um, why is We Americans by Amiri Baraka. The checkpoints placed at the border crossings function to create, sustain, and segregate the other from the dominant culture. By creating the cultural other, these checkpoints prevent certain groups from entering <coughs> and participating fully in society and its culture. The dominant culture bearers hold up the standard towards which the entire culture is trained to look. As a performing artist, performing and teaching artist, I believe that sound and language and story and physicality are among the most widely yet subtly used criterion at the borders of American culture. And I'm going to skip ahead to two years ago, at the invitation of the University of Cape Town and the Mother Tongue Theater, I traveled to South Africa as a guest artist. While there, I had the opportunity to facilitate a two-month-long voice work and storytelling workshop to girls ages 13 through 16 who lived at the Italian Catholic Mission, a charitable organization doing wonderful work with limited resources for displaced and abandoned children. Most of these girls were refugees from war-ravaged Rwanda. The missionaries cautioned me to encourage the girls to speak in English, not to get too serious, and not to excavate the girls' pasts. In these directives, I could see a parallel between South Africa and the United States. I was reminded of the Native American children who were put through American schools to erase their culture. In much the same way that Catholic mission girls influence Catholic mission influenced the girls to disassociate from their language, stories, and culture and heritage with the hope of helping them to blend into South African culture. The directives around language did not stop the girls. I took a public taxi, aka the scariest jitney ride ever, <laughs> to the mission. On the jitney you could hear clearly every dialect that exists in South Africa. However, I never heard Afrikaans, the Dutch-influenced dialect associated with white South Africans. I also never heard an American accent. In fact, I had been warned by my South African hosts never to speak on the bus. They explained that my personal safety rested in my ability to slip across the South African borders with my looks, at which my looks allowed me to do without being stopped at a cultural checkpoint which my American sound would surely have flagged. When I pushed for details, they told that I sounded privileged and perhaps worse, white. Further, this privilege and, this racial, and its racial connotations would be perceived a threat. 
In this way, the various brown South Africans on the taxi gagged me in the same way that the missionary girls had been gagged. I was very disappointed by these warnings. Part of me wanted to press my luck, but instead I just chose silence and made my way to the mission safely. Once at the mission, the girls and I engaged in various theater exercises, playing games, participating in activities that I hoped would provide them with some distance from their day-to-day -day reality and personal histories. I hoped that through the process, the girls would be able to look at their own lives from a, border, from a broader perspective. Still, I always felt the girls were not entirely present or invested in the process. Looking back now, I wondered if I had something to do with my privileged sound. Towards the end of my stay, the girls attended my solo performance of Confluence. As you saw, my performance is a narrative of my childhood memories of my family's neighborhood in Roxbury, sliding from stability to chaos as rage and violence gripped Boston during the days of public school desegregation. There is one particularly violent passage where I hide under a parked car as a riot erupts around me. I knew this would be hard for the girls to witness. When we reconvened at the mission later in the week, the girls, normally talkative, were silent. I was afraid that I and my performance had scared them. One of the girls finally spoke up, asking if the story was true. I said yes. Another asked if my mother had taught me the songs I sang in the show. I said yes. That's what got us back in this flow. The songs remind me of home, dovetailed the girl's voice. Another girl who began to sing, putting on an altogether crazy accent. Existe un rio. From a refrain she remembered it in the show. Another asked her, will you teach us your songs? Yes. In that moment, the distance the girls and I had felt in the past sessions shrank. In that moment, we crossed each other's borders. This landscape view of my life opened up a place for deeper dialogue, a place that we had never shared. Can you picture this? Us sitting on the floor in our little room, singing in, a Spa in Spanish, a language I barely know, and one that they didn't know at all? The picture is a little funny. Still, this sharing moment empowered us to embrace, embrace its entirety, our past, present, and future selves in the broadest manner possible at the time. Who knows what this future holds? But in this moment, they, I, became one humanity. We have uh, about uh, five, ten more minutes if anyone else has any burning questions. You know, I must say, my classes are open and non majors, right? So, <laughs> yes. Uh, it might be a silly question, no. but um, why uh, do it in uh, as a theater performance? Wouldn't, wouldn't the message be? come off clear if you, uh, like for example, when she asked you what's the meaning of the river, and then you said, like, um, why make it encrypted, or, or why make it uh, uh, in a theater performance rather than saying, for example, to me a river is the symbol of blah, blah, blah. Like, why, why perform it? Excellent. Um, so performance can have a disruptive nature. Um, in the thought process, hopefully taking you out of the way you day-to-day -day think and through the length of a narrative, disrupt your thinking about that and help you to think about it in another way instead of just my telling you my thoughts, allow you to arrive at that conclusion yourself through the narrative. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yes. So um, this, what you did today, is, is really the first time you've performed this section of, of, right? What, what do you, do you know where it's going from here? Where you want it to go, or is it? 
Um, I'm sure well, a lot, it decides for itself a lot of the time. Right, sometimes it decides for itself. What are you thinking? <coughs> well, I do know, um, I have, believe it or not, I have an overture from a small theater in <coughs> Panama who is very interested in bringing the work there. Um, an interesting story that kind of goes from what your question was and to your question, um, this show originally didn't have s Spanish in it. But as I was writing it, <coughs> emerged a character, and that kind of goes to your question. As I was writing a character, emerged the river of mud, mud bones. And as I, that was originally written in English, and when I was in the rehearsal process, I kept feeling in my spirit that that was not the sound of that river. And I remembered I had a colleague in Panama, which is where my mother is from, and I, I got on Facebook, and I said, remember you sang that song when we had that workshop? What was that singing? And she said, oh, that's our traditional style, or your traditional style, because you're supposed to be Panamanian. Um, so I, I said, oh, how will I learn that here? But in, that's the gift of living in Los Angeles. There's an expert in every field. So I actually found a person, and then I started playing with the actual sounds of Spanish, and I started looking for words that were very well suited to someone who's is struggling with the language and struggling with the ideas. So folks who are Spanish speakers in this room might have said, well, those are some kind of weird words and weird pronunciations, but that's part of the narrative in the story. I'm, I have a friend who's trying to, often referenced is trying to teach me Spanish, and so it's, it's like a little funny thing, but um, yeah, so hopefully, I, I hope, I I pretty much, I'm pretty sure we, I will be going to Panama, and um, <coughs> it was really, really well received in Australia, and um, we're lots of conversation about me going back to Australia this summer to do it again. But I could do the whole thing here, <laughs> <laughs> or not. I'm gonna push my luck. I'm already here, about it. okay. Um, or, or maybe down where you are. I don't know where you are. Where that glass door. Okay. But that's yeah. That's <coughs> Okay. Well, I, I think we would all certainly love to see the whole piece, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, please, let's uh, thank Professor Camp again for coming. <laughs>